Hi, everybody. Welcome to Photographer's Coffee Morning. Uh, my name is Tom Wright. I'm a photographer from the UK. I am also an educator. Um, today, we're going to have a conversation with Dennis Roy Coronel, and we're going to be talking about photography, his approach, a little bit about his history. This is our first one-to-one -one interview on this podcast. Like normally, we're about roundtables and open discussion. We're going to keep that open format, but we want to talk a little bit more specifically about individual approaches to photography and where they see the industry going. So with all that said, Dennis, did you want to introduce yourself? Can you tell the people a little bit about you and your business? Well, thank you. That was a great intro. That was wonderful. I love that you used my full name, which, by the way, was a total branding decision years ago when I started. I remember I had this funny, quirky name um, based off of a Kings of Leon song that I really loved. And then I remember coming across Jose Diaz's work and thinking like, now there's a guy who's like, he's using his name and just thinking about all these great photographers. I was like, huh, you know, Leibowitz never thought of some corny little name. So let me just use my full name. And, and I've always been a fan of my name. And I was really proud that my dad chose that name. And uh, so I, I stuck with it. Uh, nobody ever calls me by my full name, by the way, but it's obviously it just kind of translates well on screen. <laughs> so that was uh, that that worked out well. Um, I am based here in Los Angeles, born and raised, uh, wedding photographer since 2012. Uh, film school graduate, graduated the same year and came out with wedding photographers. There's a funny story there. Um, and I've just been in love with the industry since. I, I really, almost kind of cliche, I fell in love with love. You know, it was just kind of uh, going in for my first job and thinking that it was just another gig to pay the bills. And then I just came out completely enamored with the process of the raw emotions of the day and driving home, trying to figure out how to make this happen. And I did. So here we are 10 years later or 13, 11, it's going to be 11 this year. We all had two years where basically the entirety of life was on pause. Like, so I really wouldn't worry too much about not being able to keep track of the lockdown time. But like to try and like talk through it, like there's a load in that. So the first thing is like film school graduates. That's really interesting. So what attracted you to film? And like, obviously you mentioned that there was a bit of a process there going from wanting to learn about motion pictures and movies and then moving in, into wedding photography. So where did that start? Well, I was at a crossroads in my life. I think I was just a young 22-year-old with no direction. I had just gotten fired from uh, an insurance job for having a conscience. You know, so it was one of those things where I said, like, well, what, what am I going to do? And, um, and then I thought that in that moment, I knew that I was really good at sales and really good with people. And I felt that if I continued down that path of sales, I could make a really great career for myself and have the house and family and everything. But I probably wouldn't see them. And I probably would rot behind the desk. Um, and I decided that that wasn't for me. And so I had to sit down with my mom and I kind of, you know, the great thing about her is she always allowed me to kind of express myself and just kind of open up. And I shared these thoughts with her. And I thought that if I am going to, you know, work myself silly, I'm going to do it while doing something I really love. So then it was, well, what do I really love? You know, and I didn't know that quite yet. So I knew that I loved fashion and I knew that I loved cinema and I grew up on both. Um, so it was just kind of one or the other. And just really, I, I don't have this story where it's like I'm 15 and I knew exactly what I wanted to be when I grew up, you know, it was just kind of navigating life in this way and just going opening doors and leads to another. Um, and I almost went to fashion design school and then ultimately landed in fashion school. I mean, I'm sorry, in film school. That was an experience, of course. Um, which would take another conversation, you know, would take up this whole conversation. But at the end of it all, it turned out being you graduate, what's next? No jobs lined up. You have a baby, you got to pay some bills, you know. And luckily for me, the school was connecting me with jobs and I was working for a magazine. And my first job as a photographer was shooting Larry King in his home, which was pretty sweet. You know, it's like how many people can say their first gig is a paid gig and then with a, an idol just, you know, like Larry King. So that was that was pretty sweet. Um, and then the school randomly connected me with the maid of honor for a bride who, whose bride, uh, she was getting married three days out and they needed a video. And I said, let's, let's get this money. So I went and I shot video, but I put together a team of five people. Like who does that? Who shows up to a wedding shooting video with like a crew of five. Right. Um, and I knew that that was insane overkill. Yeah. No one does that. Um, but again, by the end of it all, uh, just all the raw emotions. And, and I was I was crying during the speeches. So I, I just knew that that was that was it for me. And I'm malleable in that way where it's like, okay, I'm gonna just go through these doors and see where it takes me. 
And and I've done that my whole life. And so now I'm here. The first thing that stood out to me was there that basically you've done this out of necessity. It was never a situation where you thought, you know what, I'm going to be a photographer. You weren't born with like a camera in your hand and you weren't trying to like tr- blaze a new trail. You weren't kind of suddenly inspired visionary. It was a case of, no, this, this, this is what I want to do. And this is feeling good. Let's keep going this way. And you were continuing to try new things. So rather than be in a situation where you're trying to force something, you allowed a little bit of serendipity and you let a little bit of kind of that kind of unforeseen stuff go in there and you were kind of training your gut. It, it sounds like your intention was to basically feel your way through the process. So your insurance felt uncomfortable. I'm guessing like loss adjustment or something like that where you had to deny somebody's claim or any number of other reasons. But then that felt uncomfortable. So you moved somewhere else where you thought, no, this this idea of being away from a family also feels uncomfortable and not being able to provide feels uncomfortable. So you, you're kind of moving away from these areas of discomfort relatively intuitively and ending up one, identifying that you have like three different visual passions for a starter. And we still haven't got onto stills yet. Like I'm, I am want to get into that story, but the the kind of being affected by emotion in the wedding as well is massive because I think for a lot of people like you get wedding photographers that are in it for the money or you get wedding photographers that are in it for the prestige or because they got this kind of like rock star status back in the day and feel like they've they've kind of made it when they're doing this kind of work and it's interesting to see that that isn't your intention your intention was to do something that moved somebody and I'd like to talk a little bit more about that, really. So obviously, you've you've done your first wedding. You were emotionally invested. You knew that you wanted to be there. How do you get from wedding video with a team to wedding photographer working solo? What's that kind of missing step? It was instant. Um, I knew when I left that wedding that I didn't want to pursue video. Um, a couple of things went into that decision. First, I thought, I didn't go to film school to become out a wedding videographer. So I just kind of was like, I it didn't really sit right with me or sit well with me. And then, but the biggest important piece of this was seeing the level of proximity the photographer had with the couple. And I'm sure this had to do with them building rapport over time. I just came on, but I just, it kind of felt like they were running the show and really just, you know, inserted themselves in, in that day and in, in the mechanics of the day. So I was like, I want that. I want that level of closeness and proximity. And uh, so that's what I'm going to do. And that's how I ultimately decided to pursue photography and just kind of walk away from the, you know, the narrative moving picture side of things. So it it wasn't so much the, the kind of fact that you felt the video was less impactful or less emotive. It was more that you were trying to focus on connection. So you were trying to remove a layer of, of distance from you and your client. It was more about me. And I think it's always been more about me. And I think those decisions have helped me out throughout my career, being kind of tuned into what am I feeling? What do I want? You know, um, and I knew that that's what I wanted for myself. I want what I experienced that day. I experienced that distance. Imagine what I could feel closer, you know, so I hadn't even seen the video yet. You know, I didn't know or see any of the footage we had shot that day, but I instantly and immediately knew that that's what I wanted. I wanted that proximity for myself. And I, I felt that if I was going to walk away from this degree that I just worked hard for, <clears throat> it's going to be worth it. It's no small thing as well, because as you said, you, you've moved in a direction, there's, an, there's a financial investment, there's a sunk cost there. And you've decided like, no, I really, this isn't what I thought it was. That's what I needed. This is what's next. And actually that kind of um, seems to be something that follows through your career. For any, anybody that's not already looking at your work, I'd strongly encourage you while you're listening to this podcast or while you're watching on YouTube, like pull up Dennis's work. There's a link in the description. And if you're on YouTube, I'm going to put some examples in here for you. But I want you to genuinely look through and get a feel for what Dennis was talking about in terms of proximity, in terms of emotion, in terms of involvement. Because something that stood out to me about your work, even at the beginning, was how close you seem to be to the the people that you're engaging with and photographing, and how you're not afraid of using unconventional methods or unconventional tools to get the result that you want. Um, I actually remember, this is this is obviously not a prime example, but you took a series of images on, on a, an actual scanner, as in like a flatbed document scanner, just to show that you could make an image with anything. And like the tool was important, but it wasn't as important as the artist that was, was using it. 
So when I see your work changing, it's all with that in mind. And I kind of wanted to switch gears a little bit and talk about visual identity and the way that you craft your images, um, because it is no small thing, but you have a very unique look. I've seen a change in that look since we first started talking in 2019. Um, and I kind of am interested to see that evolution. So when we first met, you were shooting with medium format cameras and you were kind of going for that very like fine art film look. And I've seen things change, but I'd rather hear it from your perspective. So where did you start in terms of visuals and where do you feel like you're moving towards? So you're absolutely right in terms of, you know, kind of getting lost in this, um, being enamored with the industry and our leaders and the fine art world and the status quo and the books and the presets and all this stuff and just kind of having this perception of that's what success is and that's what success looks like. And that's what books you the big clients and, and all that stuff. And when you are wanting to be the best, which is what I not necessarily wanting to be the best, but whatever I'm doing, be the best at it. And that's something that was instilled into me um, through my, you know, in my youth. So as I'm doing this, I do want to be the best at whatever it is I'm doing or devoting myself to. Um, and it took me down that path, but eventually I realized uh, a level of unhappiness and I, I didn't know where that was coming from. Um, looking at my work and just not being inspired and just being lost amongst the masses and just kind of, you know, seeing my work didn't speak to me anymore. And uh, I didn't know who I was. And, and, and I think, again, like I mentioned earlier, it's when you look at all the decisions that I've made and my sort of journey, it's always, it always comes back to me. And Rick Rubin, who's a music producer here in the States, um, recently had a podcast interview where he, a lot of the things he said in the interview really truly resonated for me. And, and it was just kind of interesting to see or hear somebody else speak those words. And um, what, what I'm trying to get at is that he, he spoke about the artist evolves, you know, and so the work evolves. Um, and, and I didn't understand that. And well, first off, I'm still kind of getting through this idea of, seeing myself as an artist, um, you know, recognizing that and going down that path. And what does that mean? Um, but to, to bring it back to that evolution of the aesthetic and whatnot. Um, yeah, it just goes down to me not being happy with my work um, and trying to figure myself out. And in that process, my workout. So the aesthetic changes and, and, and it became a, a journey of self-discovery of, of learning who I am and what it is that I want to say and what I want to contribute to the industry as a whole. Um, and, and that's really the, the path it took me on. And it, and it began when I was shooting film and I was working closely with my film lab, which was a photo vision print. So the owner there, Stephen Wood, uh, helped me out a lot. And we spoke about which film stock would be uh, best for me. Ultimately, we decided that Kodak, you know, Portrait 400 and 800 is something that I identified with and resonated with. And so, you know, how they scanned my work and how I shot it and exposed and the type of light that I used. And it was a process. I think it lasted about a year of just kind of trial and error until I finally reached a point where um, my work was identifiable in that way, where it's like, okay, that's that's a dentist picture. Um, and then again, you know, as you mentioned, the journey still continues. So I have since then kind of walked away from medium format film and then for, for a while film altogether. And now there's a resurgence of me kind of being reinvigorated to pick up my film cameras again or new film cameras, but in a different way. And I'm just shooting it completely different. And I think it's kind of evident as well. Like you're talking about this and while we're chatting, I'm looking at your Instagram feed and chronologically, you can see when this happens. Like 2019, your work is like at peak film. Like you can see that, that, that your film work is like leading the way. It, it, it's kind of setting your color palette, the tone for your imagery everything and like gradually you see your kind of contrast reduce like things kind of get more kind of smoother and you kind of see more green tones entering your shadows and your images you get more color shifts but crucially there's more character in the photographs so as you're scrolling from like lower down in your feed you don't just see a refinement of the kind of edit and, and the kind of tools that you've chosen you see a refinement in your vision you can see the influence in your newer work that fashion has had on your photography. Whereas I feel like earlier it was kind of like you, you were 
looking at your, your competition and not looking internally in the same way. And again, that, that isn't a criticism. We all do that. It's like um, Austin Cleon says, you steal like an artist and then you kind of refine it and do your own thing later. And you can see that you can see your identity crisis in your feed. And it's amazing to see that progression. Because for me, when I see your stuff now, I can pick it out from a lineup. And if you looked at, again, the work in 2019, and again, for those watching, I'll put examples here. For those of you listening, check out his Instagram. But if you look at your most recent pinned post, this work is something un- unusual and wonderful. Like these images that you made of Kelly, the, the, the model, singer, guitar player. And you said that she's not a model, but she definitely could model. She's amazing. Um, they have so much more of you in these images. And I kind of feel like when anybody's going through this process, because for me, I've been helping to guide photographers through this kind of stuff around about a year now, like helping them build their workflow and build the visual identity. There's so much um, time spent looking at the other people that they like and the work that inspires them externally. And I think one thing that's always stood out to me for you is that from the point where I've, I've known you at least, you've been actively trying to move away from that. So not the people that you inspire you, but visually what inspires you. And if you wanted a, a prime example, that there's a couple of images you took around about six weeks ago of a couple that you'd photographed on film back in 2019. And if that isn't a clear example of the journey that you've gone on, I don't know what is. They've gone from being these punchy, contrasty, warm, like yellow t- toned images to being something neutral and natural and focusing more on the confidence of the people in front of the camera and removing those other distractions. Um, and I, I don't know that there's a question in that as much as there is like a commentary that comes with it. So I guess that the thing that's difficult for people is that making those kinds of changes means letting go of something. Because I don't know about you, I love the film color palette. I think that those like traditional tones are things that I'm heavily drawn to. How did it actually feel going through the process of feeling like you had something nailed that people accepted as being good, moving into kind of more unfamiliar territory where people may not love what you make, but it was more honest and true to you? That's a great question. And well, as you were talking and what, what kept popping up was fear, right? And, and it's something that we all experience. It's something that I currently experience i'm still currently working through just i have uh, regular almost daily conversations with my wife about this um about how fear has dictated so many of the decisions that i've made or the decisions that i haven't made um and it, like you said it's, it's about letting go and it's about arriving at this place where you find the courage to let go of these things um and kind of go inward and i do like to talk about that journey of self-discovery and when I talk to people about their own journey, I remind them that it is 100% a journey of self-discovery. Set that, you know, set that stuff down, you know, like stop looking at your peers or competitors or whoever you're looking up to. And I think it's a great reference point for a certain reason, but uh, really what matters is who you are, you know, um, and what you have to offer. And sometimes some people have to dig deeper than others. You know, I, I, like I look out, I live in LA, so there's a lot of eccentric people and eclectic people. And I look out and I, I'm in awe and and admire people who are walking down the street just being themselves like whether it's tattoos and piercings or wild you know wardrobe or whatever style it's just like that's amazing and and i admire that and the, the courage it takes to to just be yourself wholeheartedly and unapologetic unapologetically is something that i aspire to and again i'm still in that journey of self discovery and trying to figure out who i am and what i have to say so you mentioned that shoot with Kelly and I was at home. Um, that's the way that I would describe that, that shoot. Um, she's not a model. She is an artist. That was her first sort of uh, experience being a model with uh, the agency that I work with. And we had no game plan. And I like to approach my shoots in that way. Like we'll have a reference image or so, or maybe a couple of images for a mood board um, as a general vibe, but there is no game plan. And it's really just about welcoming my subjects into my space. And this could be my studio or in a, or a wedding venue or on location somewhere. And it really is about welcoming them into my space and then creating a safe space for them where I can then be inspired by what's in front of me. And what's in front of me is themselves, is what they give me, right? And 
I, you, it's work. You have to put in that work of bringing and helping people, guiding them to that place where they're comfortable and they can feel safe and be themselves and be whatever they want to be. Um, and that is really what kind of inspires the work from, from then on, you know, so the rest of the shoot is, again, it's just, it's home to me and it felt great and it felt amazing. And when I saw those images, um, on my computer screen, there was a big smile on my face because I knew like you did it, like, this is it, like you, good job, Dennis, you know, kind of a little pat on my back. And, um, and I, and I wish and I want that for everybody, you know, and some people don't need that. Um, maybe some people aren't craving that, right. And they're perfectly fine where they are, their business models and that's it. But I'm kind of speaking to that, that artist, that person who feels something inside and, you know, maybe they have this song that they really listen to and then put it on loop. I was like, dude, there's something there. Like, listen to that, whatever that is, like, listen to it, see where it takes you, put it into your work, go see an art exhibit, you know, go to the park, draw, write, do whatever you need to do to get that out of you. And if you can kind of channel that into your work, it's, it's going to be amazing. You know, some of my shoots in the past have been inspired by a single song, you know, even like I'll listen to a song late at night and I'm like, boom, it comes to me. It's okay, let's do it. You know, so stuff like that is, is really helpful for me. And I think for people like me where I struggle with the idea of, you know, working a nine to five and all that stuff. And um, it's like, well, there's something, there's something in there. Listen to it. And, and, and what do you have to contribute? You know, that's an interesting thing, because looking from the outside and actually listening to your story from the beginning, you strike me as a very intuitive person and and somebody that's made a practice of listening when you have a good reaction and trying to respond when you when you do something and it feels correct like you said at the beginning like moving from film school from insurance and all the rest of it and making these steps in your career you didn't strike me as the kind of person that was over rationalizing and over analyzing things and i think as you said it's not easy from the outside though looking at what you are doing you can mistake composure for ease and I think the skill with which you've made these transitions is impressive. So from an internal point of view, what did it actually feel like making these leaps? And I'm going to be more specific because I kind of, I'm conscious that I, I don't want to talk in abstract because I want this to be practical for people. So there's a particular shoot that I'm thinking of from 2019. You shot in a loft, portrait 800 film, uh, indie film did the development and there's a couple i think it says uh safer days or, or something like that in the guy's t-shirt um they're sat in a window in an apartment at home and you recently re-photographed this couple on digital and on your pentax so that particular shoot the reason why i selected this is not for any reason other than they're the same people it's it, you're the same person that took those photographs but i would argue that you're not the same artist like this is the second set of images that you produced one had two completely different characters the film images from that shoot look distinctly different from digital and the film images you took of them originally years previous you can see a level of maturity in the new images that was not there before and that's not to say the old images weren't beautiful they're actually on my mood board currently that i use to try and inform some of my editing decisions but i want I wanted to kind of understand, like, when you're looking at your work changes, how do you get past the fear that comes with making these leaps, especially if you're not used to listening to your gut? How do you train your gut so you know you can listen to it and get past that worry? I am a crazy overthinker, and maybe I don't give off that vibe. I am meticulous in what I do. Everything that I do, I promise you, I ran through every scenario hundreds of times i overanalyze everything every decision every facet of life i'm walking i'm a walking like the inner monologue that's in my head is constant and the noise is wild um and i think the exterior composed facade or whatever it's i don't understand i don't know where that comes from um but you had mentioned you want it to be more of a practical discussion for your listeners and less abstract. Um, what I would say is, well, first off, yeah, those are two completely different artists and visions and aesthetics, but at the center of it all is still a person who has mastered their craft. 
And I did that very intentionally. I, everyone that I speak to is master, master your craft. So that shift was second nature, right? Um, I want that. Okay. I'm going to go and do that. Cause I know how to do that. You know, my camera works for me and I tell it what to do. If I'm having a lab scan my work, I tell them what I need out of it, out of my scans. And it's, it's just this sense of, of mastery of really knowing your stuff. Um, and I get there's very there's different learning styles and um, some people learn as they go and I'm not one of those people you know I will f- I will like flip through and read every line of, of a manual until I feel like fully confident that I can pick up that piece of equipment and know exactly what to do. Um, I like to be prepared. Again, it's just like it's an insane level of an analysis and overthinking that happens. And so like every shoot like. Although I am intuitive and I can have this free flow form um, and freestyle nature to my shoots, what helps me is having that mastery. I'm not having to second guess anything. It was like, oh, I want this. Like, okay, boom, I know how to do that. You know, and it just kind of, I just snap into it and I get it done. Um, That's been really helpful. I credit film school for that too, um, because they did, they would do theory on day one and then practical like work on the next day. So they'd smash it into you and then you go out and you're expected to execute. And I love that, you know? So um, in terms of like those two looks when the first shoot in 2019, yeah, I think I was like at the top of my game when it came to, to film. Like I loved my look and my aesthetic and I went in there like knowing exactly what I wanted to do. Those pictures are amazing. I love that couple. That couple is defining in my photography career in that, they allowed me to be who I wanted to be and shoot them how I wanted to shoot them. Um, all they, 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 they loved film and they still do. Um, and that's, you know, why they hired me. Um, but it was one of those shoots where it's like, okay, it's, it's yours. Like do, do what you will. And I did, you know, and, uh, and I, and I loved it. And so you fast forward to this recent shoot I did with them, you know, it was super short, very casual, there wasn't this pressure there wasn't any of this stuff going on and it was it was again just a matter of like hanging with old friends and just executing and i brought in a little bit of film too but um yeah visually just to come i'm in a completely different place and i i assume i'll be in a completely different place in two years too i don't know where life's going to take me you know and that's that's the thing for me is being malleable in that way of um just allowing myself to to let life take me where it wants to take me I think the the key, the key thing that I was hearing there was that preparation is is a valuable asset because what you're trying to do is reduce pressure. So in a way, you're almost describing a situation where the pressure is the enemy of experimentation. Like you you, you want to be able to follow the whim, like and you want inspiration to find you working. Like you need to know how to make it happen. Um, but essentially, reducing stress is the way that you allow yourself more space to experiment. So. If you're in a situation where you're concerned that you're not going to be able to get the image you want in the edit, or you don't know what your latitude of your film is, or you're not sure what how sharp your lens is at that s stop, or like whether or not your focus will catch this particular moment, like those are things that are variables that you can't control unless you do the work to understand what's involved. So what I'm hearing is that you might choose a new camera. And you might decide like, you know what, I'm, I'm going to buy this because it's going to be a significant step forward because you'll have thought through the pain points in your current process and you will have found exactly the reason why it makes sense for you to make a change rather than being led by an industry opinion that's like, oh, this is the good one, buy that one. Because the fact is that you are learning your own practice and you're learning the tools of your trade and not the, that of somebody next to you. Now, I'm going to come back to gear in a minute, but there's obviously like a practical element of this as well, because obviously you you are primarily at the moment, as I understand it, a wedding photographer. And we've established that one of the key factors here to getting the kind of wonderful like experimental kind of artistic results is by reducing the pressure and stress that comes in the moment. So how do you manage these kind of like experimentational ideas on a wedding day? Like how do you incorporate some of these elements into a gallery? Or do you save this for personal projects? How do you make that those two things fit? Well, for me, it's really important that a couple connects with my work and, and myself, right? I'm not going to uh, botch their wedding day and use it as a guinea pig to experiment. And, you know, they're expecting beautiful, timeless images and 
you know, they get something else and it's like, dude, what the hell, you know, this isn't, this isn't bizarre or whatever. Um, so I, what I, what I do is I make it, I make sure that the transition of like whatever I'm experimenting and playing with makes it into my work gradually so that my clients can kind of begin to see that and understand and, and they decide if they want to vibe with it or not. And obviously they're, they're going to make that decision when they hire me. So uh, my, what I'm showing is what you're going to get, you know, there, there's not going to be any surprises. If you, if you book me today, um, there isn't going to be any for your, for your wedding a year later, it's not going to look any different, you know, um, along the way, you know, I might things might happen, but I'm still going to be faithful to the reason why you booked me in the first place. And I've had that happen a few times. I've had that happen where uh, a couple has hired me for a particular aesthetic or a particular vibe. And in the middle of that transition phase, and we've had that conversation, I'm very transparent. I'm very open. And I talk to my clients and educate them on what's going on. And uh, if they wanted, for example, a little bit, the colors were shifted. I, I no longer really resonated with that. It's okay. Like I did that for them. Like that's why you hired me. And that's not a big deal. Um, do I have the power to edit it on my own later? Yeah, absolutely. You know, um, so there's that. But again, it, it's about identifying those couples or helping those identi- those couples identify with my work. Um, and now I've found that I am finding my people, um, stylists, creative directors, artists, people in the film industry, you know, people who are just kind of they're not necessarily looking or care for the trends. And that's what those conversations sound like when I'm having these consultation calls with couples. They don't care about what blog post is saying, you know, what, what trending, what's trending and what look and, and blah, 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 blah. So um, it's more about intentionality and it's more about a vibe, really, and a mood these days than, than it is about um, having a picture, a, a perfect picture. Um, and a lot of couples these days don't want to be posed and they don't want you know, this, this whole thing, they just kind of want to enjoy their celebrations. And, you know, I think we talked about this in clubhouse and I think COVID has a lot to do with that. You know, and the pandemic had a lot to do and people's priorities shifted and what they, how they perceive the world around them and their friends and families and relatives and how they want to experience life has changed. Um, and you know, you got to keep your ears to the ground and then be able to, to go with that and give, you know, and ho- hopefully that resonates with you. Cause at the end of the day, as I mentioned earlier, I do I do do things for myself first. You know, I have to make myself happy. Um, I have to be happy with my work. As a result, the couples will be happy with that. You are a person that shares your inspiration in public. Like you're very eclectic in your taste, without a doubt. Like you've got an awful lot of different interests. And you are not shy about sharing another photographer's work, uh, the work from magazines, fashion inspirations, travel, literature, music, anything. If it goes into your brain and you think this is great, rather than just hitting the save button on Instagram, you're reposting it to your stories. And I wondered like how much of that is in an effort to try and help your clients go on that journey with you to see the progression that's happening in your mind. Yeah, it's it's not just my clients, but it's my peers too. You know, it's to show my peers that, hey man, like it's okay. Like you you just step away for a moment, like go watch a movie. You know, again, like flip through a magazine, watch a documentary, uh, read a book, you know, do do something else, do something different, you know, um, allow yourself to just just honestly just live life um, and and let that inspire you. And so that, that's why I do that. And it also kind of it helps me. But I, I like to share that, like the possibilities Like you can draw inspiration from anywhere. And I, and I love I love interior design. You know, I love uh there's just so much that I love and, and you see that, you know, as you mentioned in, in what I share on my stories as a sort of like inspo mood board or whatever. Um, and people see that and people are either going to like it or they're not going to like it. And I know that I'm sure I've lost followers because of what I'm sharing and that's perfectly okay because I'm trying to like find my tribe, you know, kind of find my people and uh, allow other people to find me too, whether it's planners or vendors or venues or couples or, or whatever like defining what you find beautiful is quite difficult as well and i feel like the method that you're using is very public without a doubt but it's also a practice that not every photographer is in like and i have boards and boards and boards of saved stuff on instagram because more and more often i'm finding it as being quite a noisy platform um like lots and lots of very low quality very kind of like junky content which is fine there's a place for it like i love junk food as much as the next guy but 
every so often, like when you do find something genuinely nourishing, something that you think is like, no, this actually speaks to me on a deeper level. This is inspirational. The color palette's incredible. Like I, I don't always have the mental energy to process it there and then. So very often I'll react to it on like a, a like a gut level, save it and come back to it later. And I think that even if you don't feel brave enough to share it on your stories every time you find something inspirational, like being in the habit of doing that will dramatically accelerate your growth as an artist because without it, the only thing you're consuming is going to be the junk food that's put in front of you. So I'd encourage anybody to to do exactly what you're doing. Make sure that you're looking outside of your industry. Try and follow your aesthetic outside of your given application because if you're trying to do something different, you're going to need help from outside of your industry. If you're trying to work on wedding photography, but the only thing you ever look at is fearless photographers, or you're only looking at the award winners, you're never going to, you're never going to change. There's not going to be any kind of improvement. You're it's, it's kind of, it's looking in the wrong place. If you want to be the same and you want to do something similar to other people, continue doing what you're doing. But if you want to do something fresh, you're going to need to choose fresh ingredients. Like that said, in, in your case, like you've, you've not just looked at your visual inspiration as a way of separating yourself. You have taken a fairly like radical stand from a kind of industry point of view in that you've kind of eschewed all presets and kind of like color profiles, et cetera, that people are selling. And you, you've made a choice to kind of lean into the colors that come out of your camera. Like what led you to that decision? Again, it was just like this the satisfaction with with my work and understanding that like I, I didn't want to be a carbon copy anymore you know and some of these presets are really beautiful and and i get it i i, I totally get it what helped me too was the distance i had put between myself and film right so i no longer was shooting medium format film in that way you know i wasn't shooting 30 40 50 60 rolls per event or whatever and so that meant that oh i'm not going for the film look why am I using film emulation presets? You know, so so what what is your look? And either way, I had created an aesthetic for myself while shooting film that these presets couldn't create anyway. You know, so I had I had to create my own customized preset off of that preset, and and spend some time doing that. So I was like, okay, let's let's just kind of throw it all away. And you know, that's something kind of I've done and I do over and over again. I'm not afraid to do that. Where I could just like let's just throw it away. It was just like sl- clean slate start fresh and let's let's see what happens and i did that um and then i realized that i wanted to change camera systems and and that was just because of one little camera that didn't really fit with my with my kit anymore which was the um, x100v just didn't really match well with my fuji gfx in terms of picture quality it's a great little camera i loved it it was fun um but it just wasn't up to par you know it wasn't so I replaced it and I replaced it with a Leica Q2. And then that was my gateway drug. I was like, damn, that's, that's it. Like just straight out of camera. I looked at those colors and the, that the color science was amazing. The shooting experience was, was amazing and incredible. And something about holding that camera and that heft, that weight, that, that metal aluminum body or whatever it is. It's just like, dude, this is a great piece of engineering. And then I discovered my next camera, which was the Leica SL2. And then I was like, oh, it's the same sensor as the Q2. I'm like, sorry, GFX. Like, bye. You know, and so I, you know, you go, you kind of end up taking a step backwards because you're going from, you know, larger than full frame, almost medium format GFX back to a full frame, you know, but I'm doing that for cohesiveness. And also maybe because I'm lazy, you know, I, I want all my stuff to be cohesive and I want, I want to make it easier for myself. I don't want to have to worry about matching my colors and, Working with different files and working in this way has made my life so much easier. My workflow is better. I'm better for it. You know, I don't stress as much. And just, again, walking into a shoot or an event with knowing that my gear is going to back me up and do exactly what I needed to do is great. And that's what I love so much about the Leicas is that they get out of my way. You know, I, I mentioned earlier about mastering your craft and, and getting knowing exactly what you need your cameras to do. And these guys do it for me like quicker and better than any other system I've used. I'm not fumbling around with settings and all this other or buttons or anything else. And it's just like, let's just get it done. You know, they're like the perfect second shooter. Let's just get it done. <laughs> you mentioned the Fuji X100V. And for me, that's actually been a gateway drug as well. Like I enjoy using that camera like more than anything else I've ever touched. 
it is without a doubt the most fun I've ever had with any camera, like film or digital. And that's a bold statement, but it's true. But this kind of goes back to a comment that you made previously about the changing of film aesthetic. So for me, the Fujifilm X100V feels more like a point and shoot role and not like a medium format camera role. Like the, the, the Leica Q2, for those that don't know, is a full frame camera in a tiny body with a fixed 28 millimeter 1.7 lens on it. And it is incredible. It's very expensive, but it's very worth it. Um, the main difference is the Fuji X100V is a smaller sensor. And when you're looking at film now, there are kind of two camps, really. There are those people that are kind of shoot medium format for quality, that want the superior color palette, the kind of depth of tones and the complexity that you get from shooting real film. And there are people that are kind of coming up that are asking me, like from my peer group, that are saying like, I want to buy a camera and they want to buy the Contax T2 or the Contax T3, which are cameras popularized by the Kardashians and a bunch of social media influencers because they take 35 millimeter film and they're tiny. They got a 35 2.8 lens and they are like auto exposure pretty much only. They've got a flash on them. They work amazing. Um, they've got grain. They've got color shifts. Things look funky. Nothing sharp, like not super sharp, like medium format. But that has an appeal to the younger generation than me and maybe my generation too that has a wider appeal. There are people, normal human beings, asking me about these cameras because they want that aesthetic. For me, that's what the Fuji X100V does, but it can't do the medium format look. Whereas the Q2, when I, when I played with that recently, that can. It, it can look just as clean as a Contax 645 easily, easily. So my question then is, because this is kind of an area that I see. So you've split your work into essentially three areas. You've got the high quality film. You've got the high quality digital that can dirty up if you want it to. And you've got the stuff that feels like a memory. You've got the point and shoot vibe. You've got the nostalgia. One of the interesting things for me is that most photographers would pick one and not do the other two. And what I love is seeing how those three things sit together. Um, Because again, looking at the same couple that we've been talking about right now, there are those three avenues. So how do you decide when and where to use each approach? Because I've seen you use all three in all sorts of different situations. Is it an intuitive thing? Is it something you pre-plan, like you said, try and prepare for ahead of time and know exactly when it's going to be a film shot or when it's going to be a point and shoot shot? How do you approach that side of it? How do you mix all these things together and keep it feeling cohesive? Sure. I think it's absolutely in a matter of intuition. Um, and the only thing I know ahead of time is that I'm going to listen to myself. So um, I just did an engagement shoot with four cameras on me. So I had my Q2 around my neck. I had my SL2 on my shoulder. And then I had this new guy that I got the night before. So I had this in one of my pockets. And then I had another Nikon point and shoot in my other pocket. You know, so this is a 35 millimeter focal length. The other one's a 28 millimeter focal length. And again, it's just a matter of, well, kind of backtrack a little bit. That couple, the people who want film, they're not the same people who wanted film a few years ago. You know, they don't want the fine art look. And that's not why they want it. Nostalgia, mood, vibe, and cool. Those are really the things that couples are seeing. And it's as simple as that. We don't need to have a complex or crazy conversation about it. That's really what it is. My wife is a perfect example of this. So she, when we first met, she started telling me, oh my God, you shoot film and it's so cool. And I'm like, dude, I don't want to shoot film. It's not that cool anymore. Like, you know, it's, and she's like, no, but it's so cool. And it's just like, it gives me these vibes and this nostalgia. And I didn't get it then. and I didn't see it then, but she's exactly who my next bride's going to be. Those are our brides of the future. Those are our clients of the future, whether it's commercial advertising or whatever, you know, it's like, that's what they want. These 90s babies are now, you know, in charge and, and, and that's what they want. And you got to listen to them and it's coming and you uh, have to adapt or, but it should resonate with you too. And you have to stay true to yourself and you should be kind of genuine about your craft in that way. And it's like first kind of sit with it and it's like, does it, do I resonate with this work? And yes, cool, great, let's go. You know, so I now, again, have this little resurgence of film in me again. I fall in love with it again, but in a completely different way. I don't shoot film the way that I used to shoot. 
I don't have, um, I'm not using labs with, with profiles, you know, with my profile anymore. It's like, give me a straight scan and let's see what I could do. And now as of recently, I'm scanning my own stuff, you know? Um, and, and that's been, that's been a big game changer for me too. So how I make that decision in the moment, it's just, it's just the moment, you know, does it call for it? Does it speak to me? Do I want to have this documented on, you know, on these chemicals or do, or do I want it in, in some binary? Um, and that's just, that's just a, I honestly, it's, it's good experience. That's just going to be experience. You just mentioned self scanning as well, because that's a, a time consuming process. So anybody that was arguing before, oh, you're just not editing your images because you're lazy. That clearly is not the case because self scanning is slow. It's a slow process. You have to handle every in- image individually. There's no batching. There's nothing like that. You have to do it one at a time with intention, and you have to understand how you expose your negative to get that to look right. So I guess my follow up question was. Let's say that you the QT didn't exist and you could not get the that particular green tone that you love in the shadows just from the camera without having to do tons of work. Or if you needed something to kind of like work harder, would you still be looking for those presets? Is is it more that you found on something and arrived at something that feels like it fits your vision and not so much a case of letting it be its own thing? You've been searching and, and achieved, or is it a case of kind of like relaxing and letting the thing be what it wants to be and like just going with the flow a little bit more is it relaxation or have you discovered something that fits perfectly um i think it might be a combination of the two that's a great question because i'm not having to think about that um and i definitely like the whole relaxation thing um i do not enjoy editing as much and i gripe about it all the time with my wife and I look forward. I, I wish I had a team with me. Like I want an editor. I want to hear, hear my cards and you know what I want and get it done, you know? Um, but yeah, at the same time I found something and again, Kelly shoot is that for me. So I don't have a lot of work since that shoot. And um, we're talking about the, the artist, the musician that we were talking about earlier. Um, so it's just a new chapter and where it's really fresh still. So we're going to, we have yet to see what, what happens and what comes of that and how I can apply that into my client work. Um, so maybe in six months we'll start seeing, you know, what that looks like and how that affects my work. Um, but I pushed that one in heavily and, and I asked people to share my work on Instagram, something I've never done before because I felt so strongly about that aesthetic and just that, that work and I kind of wanted to just make my announcement like hey like this is me this is who I am like please share my work um and I'm really grateful for all of those that did including yourself um but yeah so I, I don't know I don't I don't know what's going to happen um what my work is going to look like I know that that is kind of a starting point a new starting point right and uh I mentioned earlier I'm like about I open doors and I just see where they take me you know and just kind of see what happens next um but yeah but I, I definitely do think i've found something that works for me and i'd agree like again like from the outside you can see the difference in the work and we started with this it's kind of interesting to see what we've got to like you, i i really do feel like as a, as a photographer you have one of the most strong visual identities of anybody that i've seen anywhere and that isn't just me saying that like that you've come up in conversations previously that this this podcast is generally a round table discussion and very often you've come up in conversation around people that are doing things that require more character and this is kind of something where i want to kind of put some of the credibility back into this that you have worked at the absolute pinnacle of the wedding industry you live in an environment where basically everybody is visually educated like you can't argue that LA is a, is a town without a sense of aesthetic. You can't argue that anywhere, anywhere near you, there is somebody without an opinion about what it should be visually arresting and what should kind of like, and what something should look like. And I feel like you said at the beginning, you're into fashion and I would strongly disagree with you. You are into style. You're the kind of person that will not allow somebody else's opinion of what looks cool affect you because you don't care. The fact is that you're more interested in making a decision that will stand you in good stead in five, 10, 20 years time and feel more natural and gradually refining a sense of what it is to exist as yourself. 
And that sounds like a very kind of like ephemeral thing, but it isn't. It's practical. You're making gradual changes that get you closer to the ideal version of yourself that you see. And going back to like the Ira Glass quote, you've always had the taste and you're gradually building the tools and the the bravery to follow through on it. So for those people that are, say, at the beginning stages of the career, or maybe they've been doing this for a long time and they're stuck in a rut, what would you say to that photographer? Imagine yourself sat in that insurance cubicle and thinking like, give yourself some advice today that would have changed your life then. What would you say to that person stuck in their day job? How do you get out of that and into a situation where you're living the life you want and you're working in a way that feels authentic? Yeah, that's great. Um, what's, what's coming to mind right now is that to that person, wherever they're at, it's hard, right? It, it's hard. Um, where I'm at, it's hard too. And I'm really happy with my work. Um, so if you're going to choose a, like, choose your hard, it's hard work. It's hard work to get to know yourself. It's hard work to find the courage. It's hard work to let go. It's hard work to quiet the noise that's inside your head. That little kind of that, you know, it's just like, it's hard work, but if you're going to do hard, no matter what, it's going to be hard. So choose, choose your hard and get after it, you know, go, go, go do it for yourself first you know, do it, do it for yourself first. And the rest just kind of falls into place and it just follows. So, you know, you're going to sit in that cubicle, you're going to sit behind that desk. Um, and years later, you know, years, days and time is going to pass you by like, damn, I didn't do it. Why didn't I do it? Um, I'm asking myself that question right now too, with many things too, but I'm, I'm still on this path and journey of self-discovery and I'm doing it for myself. So again, uh, choose your heart. You know, it, it's not easy. Um, be meticulous about your work and your ethic and your craft. Um, be meticulous about getting to know yourself. Like, ask yourself the hard questions. You know, it's it's in there. It's inside. Um, bring that stuff out, you know, and figure out what you need to do to get it out. That is great advice. And for the people at home, if they want to follow your work going forward, where's the best place to get in touch with you? Currently, Instagram, you could follow me at Dennis Roy Coronel. Uh, Tom, I'm sure you'll have the spelling there. Um, that's currently the best platform to find me and find my work. And if you're not already following him, you should be. So definitely get on that now. But Dennis, thank you so much for taking this time to talk to me. Like, I, I really do appreciate it. It's kind of felt like a privilege to be able to ask you the questions I've kind of been thinking of really loudly for the last three or four years. Um, we'd love to, we'd love to have you back in the future. Um, and yeah, just thank you again for being generous with your time. Tom, thank you so much for having me. I'd love to come back. It was a great pleasure talking to you. I loved it. So let me know. I'll be back.